Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of The Nonprofit Show, specifically Fundraisers Friday. I have one of my all-time faves from the nonprofit sector, Tony Bell. Welcome back, Mr. Nonprofit Consultancy and Guru. Well, thank you so much again for having me, and happy Friday. I always look forward to these conversations, so uh, so I'm psyched and excited to, to dive in. <laughs> You know, Tony, I was thinking today um, as I'm getting ready to come to work in the shower, of course, I do my best thinking because we you know, all do. <laughs> it's like I'm a genius and I'm a great singer in the shower, let's just say. But um, I was thinking, you know, I have learned so much from you in this short period of time that I've known you, you know, five years. But, um, you know, you have this like lovely, lovely spirit of of your your personality and the things that you see and and what you observe and what you teach and what you advise and it is such a blessing to have that wisdom um in my life in our sector and so i just really wanted to witness that because this is a tough topic that we're going to talk about today and even in the green room, you were like, Julia, this has been blowing up in the past couple of days. It, it has. Yeah. It's like, why development directors leave after 19 months? And spoiler alert, Tony's going to share with us that it's actually e even a shorter period of time. Right? <laughs> I mean, so we really need to get into this and, okay. and, and help talk about it. Um, you know, we are so grateful to our amazing sponsors that that guide us um, with their financial support, but not their editorial support. These folks don't put any pressure on us to cover topics or discuss things. And, and that's really incredible because that is not always the case in broadcasting. And so our amazing sponsors include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, and 180 Management Group. If you would like to, to join this illustrious group of presenting sponsors, give me a shout out and I'll talk to you about that um, because it's really a fun uh, partnership that we have with these folks. More importantly, we have this great partnership with the amazing Tony Bell, Mr. Nonprofit Consultancy with us along with our other cohorts. But I'm going to start out right here. Where does the stat or this notion that our development directors, Tony, are only lasting 19 months? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think I, I recall us having a conversation and when the uh, when the president of AFP Global, right, was was on the show and talking Mike, about, yeah, yeah Mike when Geiger. Mike Geiger was on, yeah, I was talking about the statistic of of 19 months is oh, kind yeah. of the average stay, if you will, of a development mm -hmm. professional. And then as I dug deeper in, into it, as, as you and I were talking about it and um, and not being super surprised by the statistic, but wanting to know more, uh, I saw that the Lilly School of Fundraising, you know, they put out a publication that said anywhere from 12 to 16 months or 16 to 18. So uh, so it really does show that there's a lot of opportunity uh, for us as a sector to do better uh, when it comes to retaining talent uh, and specifically retaining talent within the development uh, space, uh, which really is the fuel to the engine of all of our nonprofit organizations. Right. You know, Tony, um, I'm recalling that in in the very, I would say, like, honest to goodness, like six months of the nonprofit show, we had an HR expert um, on and they said that whether you're a janitor or you're a CEO, it takes about 12 months to learn a job. And that's not just what you have to do, but that's the culture. That's like how to dress everybody's names, where to go to to lunch, how long it takes you to get to the, the office or the campus, all of these things, all of these things. And 12 months is a heck of a long time. And it's a heck of a short time if we're not keeping these people except for a handful of months after, right? No, no, for sure. I mean, you named all the things that, you know, that folks need to do to ramp up to be successful 
you know, and, and there's systems included in that, right? And the, the unique technologies or processes within that organization. So there, there is a, a runway uh, that we should expect new employees and, and development folks specifically, uh, you know, a, a long runway that we should expect them to travel on uh, before we start seeing the kind of results uh, that you might like to see from that sort of professional. Right. And, you know, I think that that is something that does not get discussed. I've never been on a board where in a board meeting where anyone brings that up. It's always like, what are the numbers? Are they winners or are they a loser? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, yeah. it's a really interesting uh, dynamic. Um, and I don't know, man, I don't know how we got people to understand that we it's a relationship. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe we just we think of it as money in the bank <laughs> and we look mm -hmm. at the ledger sheet and that's it. We don't think about the relationship. What do you think is is at the core of this? Well, I think there are a couple of things that are kind of at the core of why folks are transitioning uh, so quickly from from their jobs. So one of the things that comes to mind are position resources. So we brought you in as a fundraising professional to raise money for this dynamic mission uh, that, you know, and, and incredible results within the organization. But what resources does this professional have to succeed in the job? And so when I talk about resources, it could be any number of things from current technology to be able to do the job right. It might be a travel and entertainment. Yes, I said it, a travel <laughs> and entertainment budget so that, you know, they they have the resources to travel and meet folks and, and the resources to um, go to networking events or be a member of the chamber or be a member of AFP. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, you know, that's just a short list of resources. So there's that. Uh, they're setting up the appropriate expectations from the start about what's expected of the individual that that's serving in this role. Sometimes there are silos uh, and folks don't want to work in a silo, especially not in development. Uh, and then the other thing would be kind of salary disparity and then growth opportunities. So there right. is a long list of reasons why. And a lot of these, I will say, are not unique to the nonprofit sector. Uh, I think a lot of the things that I just mentioned are a catalyst for folks, regardless of where they work, uh, to want to look for other opportunities. But as we talk specifically about development professionals, I think position resources, a greater understanding of expectations, providing that runway that folks need to succeed, and not creating a siloed environment are definitely going to help prevent top talent from wanting to leave your organization so quickly. So, you know, what's so fascinating to me is that we're talking about professionals. We're talking about people that we should know what they do in their jobs. Mm -hmm. But when I'm hearing you speak, it's kind of hitting me up inside the head with the realization that we don't really know what these people do. You know, mm -hmm. we could say we could write a job description for the day porter or the program director or the officer in charge of, you know, something to do with accounting or, or whatever, we can get real specific on what these folks need to do. Mm -hmm. But I would love your feedback on this because I don't know if we always know what the development folks do. We have our prejudices and, and you and I've talked about this before, you know, that they're just glad handers that go out, go to events, take people to lunch and beg for money. There, there is, there probably is this perception that it is easier than it really is <laughs> to yeah. succeed uh, in in fundraising. Um, so what what I what I think I hear you saying there, Julia, is you know we talked a little bit about what are the motivators or the, or the enablers for folks to want to leave an organization. Mm -hmm. So what can we do as an organization? to prevent that from, from happening. And part of that, I think, and you, you kicked it off beautifully, uh, is, folks to, is for there to be a deep understanding of the work uh, mm -hmm. beyond just a board member's understanding because of a webinar 
or a CEO's understanding uh, based on a book that they read. Uh, for them to really have the lived experience of fundraising uh, at a senior level or board level um, is really, really important. You know, I, I think in terms of, of what you initially said around the understanding of the work uh, and what it really takes. I think for organizations to be better uh, at retaining talent, one of the things is to create that culture of philanthropy throughout the organization, right? Across all levels of the organization. Um, the other thing is to continue to, and, and this is on us, and that's why I love that you selected this as one of the topics, to continue to move this work forward as a profession. Uh, it's, you know, it's, yeah. it's more than a hobby. It's more than something right. that folks do because they're passionate about a particular cause. It goes beyond that. They're bringing skill sets and a tenacity to this work uh, mm -hmm. that goes beyond passion uh, mm -hmm. or a connection to, to a mission. Uh, the other thing might be succession planning. I think organizations, just historically from my experience, um, can do a better job at succession planning. One of the many things that I read in preparing for today's conversation was how long an organization, especially small and middle-sized organizations, will go without a development professional when someone leaves. So they'll go as long mm -hmm. as the amount of time that the individual stayed. So it will take anywhere. And I'm sorry that I'm laughing because it's really not funny, but it's just kind of the irony. Yeah. You know, folks, leave, folks leave within 16 to 18 months. Well, for a small and mid-sized organi organization, it takes them 16 to 18 months to bring on a, a new yeah. you know, person to serve in that capacity. So uh, so there are a lot of things we could do in terms of, of how we are leading organizations and what's taking place within our organizations to prevent some of, of the talent from wanting to go in the first place. Right. You know what? That is um, crazy smart. The concept of just filling that void. And that's something we haven't even talked about, Tony. We've just been like saying, you know, kind of what the ecosystem is. Let's drill down. And, and, and what are you hearing, observing throughout your illustrious career as why people are are making that choice. Like they don't feel like they can stay and that they're so pressured or burdened. Um, because I don't, I think sometimes when you, you see that stat about the short term, you think that these folks are just going on to something sexier and shinier and they're just, you, they're going to a, a better organization. I don't think that's the case. I mean, yeah, I don't think that, yeah, I, I don't think that everyone is, is looking for a greener pasture. I, I don't think that that's, you know, that that's always the case. Mm -hmm. um, folks, I, again, just based on my experience, uh, individuals that are serving in these roles really do serve for the love of, of the work. And mm -hmm. so they want to be in an environment where that love is for the work is recognized. You know, so, so again, I, I think that pressures that lead to job change are things like a lack of understanding of what the work really is mm -hmm. at the senior level and at the board level. Uh, and I think part of it is also having the uh, resources necessary in order to succeed in the role. So I, I, I hear and, and see those as being uh, two of the primary reasons uh, why folks feel a pressure um, to want to change jobs. Right. You know, I, uh, I'll never forget the time I was speaking with a development director of an organization. It was running about a 60 to $70 million budget. And they um, confessed to me one of the, I asked them, which, you know, what's the hardest part of your job? And uh, they said, it's not surprisingly when somebody says no. It's every day when I drive to our office and it was a campus environment, I get out of my car and I walk through the, the parking lot, through security, the doors, through our campus. I feel like all eyes are on me because if I don't perform, we can't do all the programming. 
And I feel like if I'm not confident and I'm not like, woohoo, yay team, money's coming in, you know, that everybody's like fearful for their jobs. And I thought that was so profound and shockingly sad. I mean, the pressure that this man felt um, was astonishing. And I had never thought about that. I mean, I, we know, oh, the wolves at the door and we can't do this programming if we don't get you know, this big donor and, you know, all that, which is true and real, but mm -hmm. the, the man carried that mantle of responsibility. Wow. Yeah. It's almost like he felt like he had to walk through the door with a balance sheet every morning saying, this is what we have, you know, what we have in the bank and no one person, regardless of the size of the organization, because but a lot of, of my work historically has been with small to medium size organizations. I love to build things. So I love working with small to medium-sized nonprofit organizations. And definitely the development professionals in those spaces really feel the pressure uh, around the sustainability and the health of, of the organization. But no one person should feel that. Uh, so uh, so I, I wouldn't want anyone to feel that, but if someone's going to, it needs to be a shared feeling across the, across the organization or, or senior leadership uh, and really not rest on the so, on the shoulders of, of one individual. So before we move on, how do you do that, right? Like, because, you know, leadership in so many ways is about communicating confidence and in cause selling, you know, we're raw, raw, and we're all excited and we're trying to get people on the bandwagon. I mean, I could go on and on using all of those sales phrases, but how do we in an authentic way say, I'm scared of shit. And oh, I can't believe I just said that five years and I've been really good about cussing. And that was my first one. Ooh. I just make you super comfortable, Julia. That's all. <laughs> wow. My producer is going to be so angry with me. I'm going to be in trouble today when we get off the show. Anyway, but it's real. I'm saying the real truth here. You know, we get, it's such, it's so filled with not only pressure, but Tony, I've got to add another swear word, the F word, fear, right? Mm -hmm. Like how mm -hmm. we navigate this overwhelming sense of responsibility and fear and then dare I say shame when it doesn't go through, when mm -hmm. you're like, I've got this big meeting, it's taken me months and they're going to come through and all our problems are going to be solved. And it doesn't happen. Like, mm -hmm. how do we navigate that? So, you know, one of the things that I mentioned around, you know, a, a, a key component of retaining great talent really is having that culture of philanthropy throughout the entire organization. And so what does a culture of philanthropy really mean? Yeah. It means an understanding of what giving looks like for your organization. It means an understanding of what uh, donors kind of look like. When I say look like, like what, who is donating to the organization? Uh, mm -hmm. Who typically is leaning into the mission? A culture of philanthropy means everyone's involved in the fundraising process. Everyone understands its importance and everybody celebrates the steps along the way to success. So you mentioned cost selling and, and there, there's a lot of optimism within, within cost selling. And I think a lot of optimism within all of the work that we do uh, in the nonprofit space, right? Because it, when we talked about cost selling and, and selling, I mean, we're, we're selling a, a solution to a community need and, and there's a lot of optimism, you know, in, in that. Uh, but, it, you know, it, it's very challenging uh, and it, it requires a lot of work uh, and it requires a lot of, uh, of authenticity and a lot of people engaged in the process. Yeah. You know, I appreciate you drilling down a little bit more on that, because to me, what you just said is an antidote for the isolation and, and even the fear. Right. If you have that, if you go to work every day and people are lifting you up and cheering you on and and helping you move forward. Oh, my gosh. It's like when you leave your home and, and if you've left your home and and your family and your mate are, is, are saying, you look great, you're going to do this, yay team, versus, wow, what a loser. You know, all those negative thoughts. How do you proceed with your day, right? 
So, I mean, I love this culture of philanthropy um, aspect of how we need to support, you know, this process. Well, and and we, you know, we need to celebrate. And that is something that I I also believe going back again to the cost selling cycle. I have a feeling we'll reflect on that many times in our conversations uh, moving forward. But but part of the cost selling cycle also allows you to celebrate steps along the way. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're having these little celebrations along the way to kind of the big ask and, and the big celebration. Uh, mm-hmm. But also keeping it real when we talk about, you know, welcoming and embracing objections and what that looks mm-hmm. like. And, uh, and again, just the authenticity around the conversations mm-hmm. uh, and celebrating the, the, you know, the small steps along the way. Yeah, I like that. And boy, I I appreciate you saying that because I don't see that enough. I really don't. I really, really don't. Okay, we don't have a lot of time left. And this is the This is going to get some people a little torqued. And so I can't wait to have this discussion. But how can we incentivize, and I know that's another dirty word, this this episode has been filled with some naughty vocabulary, (laughs) but how can we reward or bonus out or in, in really encourage folks to stay with us, keep on the mission as a professional? Oh my goodness. If we, if you and I were in the for-profit sector and we didn't know what these bonus opportunities or rewards were, Mm -hmm. we'd be gone. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, this is where I feel like I wish I was a judge on America's Got Talent. I could just have a golden buzzer for everybody. Right. Just hit the golden buzzer for everybody. Right. But I but I'm really glad you asked this question, Julia, because it's important that we always remember it's the same with our donors. It's the same with everyone we engage with. One size does not fit all. And the same exists when we talk about bonuses and incentives. What I consider to be a bonus or an incentive may be very different from what you define to be a bonus or an incentive. I may feel really great with how I'm being compensated, but I sure would like another week off. You know, so there are there are conversations that we can be having with our team members to really, again, you know, individualize and personalize what that experience looks like for them within the organization, within boundaries, of course, right? I mean, there, there still have to be standards of practice and, and all of that. Uh, but having, again, the transparent, honest conversation around what is an incentive for me? Is it being able to work from home three days out of the week? Is it on Mondays, I want to come in and, you know, and from 10 to six, but on, on Fridays, I want to work a half a day. I mean, really having those, those conversations, because I think rewards and bonuses are defined by folks very differently. Uh, and it's not always about money. Wow. So when you say that, and when you frame it up like that, um, to me, it blasts open the conversation because the first comment that you're going to get is, oh, we can't afford that. We don't have the money. But when you look at some of these other ways, um, you can navigate it. Mm -hmm. Right. I love. Absolutely. Yeah. I love that you said this and I agree. Um, It's not always about the money because that has tax implications. That has other, you know, there's so many folks I've heard like, yeah, I got a bonus, I got a raise or I got this, but now I'm staying, I'm at the same place because I'm having to pay more taxes. I mean, do you know what I mean? It's, there's a lot going on versus, yeah, I'd like to be able to, you know, coach the, our child's soccer club, or I'd like to be able to take more time off or work from home, all of those things. I think another thing that I've seen, uh, interestingly enough, uh, in, in my community. And I, I'd love to, to know if you've seen this. And again, we don't have a lot of time, but I've seen um, organizations go after in-kind donors. And I'm thinking of, in my community years ago, a grocery store chain, and they got the grocery store to give significant, like $250 gift cards. Mm-hmm. And they made that donation and then those gift cards were given to the employees 
$250 grocery card for a lot of families is, is like gold falling from the heavens. Right. Um, and so it made, it was like a win-win for everybody. And we don't seem to see enough of this. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I, I've seen that too. And, and, uh, you know, and again, when we're making the ask of that of that retailer, they understand very specifically what the gift is being used for. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've seen that at you know employee appreciation, like an annual employee appreciation event. Uh, you know, historically, I I was part of organizations where we might have an annual picnic, and then at the annual picnic, you know, th those types of things would be given out, uh, and they do go a long way in, in terms of just, you know, employee motivation and, and, and retention. So that's a really creative way of, of just helping folks feel good about, you know, the work that they're doing and, and just giving them that little extra something. Yeah. Uh, so that's a really good example. Well, you know, and I think too, if we're looking at this horrific bleed off of talent and you brought up something, I don't know why I never thought of it, Tony, but it's not just when somebody leaves, it's how they're being replaced. And if you're, if you're, taking that equal amount of time to replace somebody um what we need to focus on is this retention factor um that ultimately saves us money mm -hmm. ultimately. oh without a doubt yeah i mean well i mean part of what you you opened up you opened up today's conversation julia just reminding everyone that this is a relationship business and so when you talk about such a short period of time that a development professional is going to serve an organization, how is that making your donor feel? And what what amount of trust is being lost at the donor level when they feel like themselves that there is this revolving door of talent? And so I'm not going to question the talent. I'm going to question the senior leadership and what are they doing wrong that they can't retain these folks because now I'm being introduced to my third development professional in two years. And I love that you said that because absolutely, I think that the um, value of trust and consistency speaks so highly. I mean, it, you wouldn't, let's just say you wouldn't do this with a doctor or an attorney or your dentist, right? I mean, if, if things are, you know, always changing, you're going to be like, whoa, what's wrong with this ecosystem? And and I'm I'm entrusting them with my my resources, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I recently had I recently had that experience with a veterinarian. It was like the the fourth veterinarian as part of this this group, and so I was starting to question like, what's going on here? And, you know, that they have all of these vets kind of cycling in and out. Yeah, yeah, I love that you brought that up. See, that's why you are a genius, Mr. Tony. You're too Bell. kind, you're too kind. Oh my I'm gosh. so glad that's... I have my tissues, Julia, because you're just too kind. <laughs> well, we were gonna talk about advocacy, but we've run out of time because I just been chit-chatting and obviously I've been swearing during the episode. So um, I have to get, get off the episode with as much grace as I can today. Um, and again, I want to thank all of our presenting sponsors, Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, your part-time controller, Fundraisers Friday, which is today, whoop, whoop, and 180 Management Group. The amazing Tony Bell, Mr. Nonprofit Consultancy, has joined us. Um, I don't know if you know this, but I'm on the West Coast. He's on the East Coast. And it's always really cool to, uh, well, it's hot right now. <laughs> it's fun to talk about, you know, how we perceive our sector um, from the regional aspects with where we work and where we live. And so it, it was, it's always a joy, Tony, to, to get this um, time with you and this, this intellectual conversation going. This is not a story that's going away, right, Tony? I mean, this is, we we need to be staying on this for sure and and i think i mentioned to you julia just in the last couple of days on linkedin i've seen a lot of conversations around this topic so please if, if you're on linkedin engage in, in the conversations uh real quickly part of the way to continue to advocate for the profession is through linkedin and through continued support of shows like the nonprofit show and organizations like afp 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I love that you brought that up and thank you um, because this is, this speaks to the health of our beloved sector. It really does. And I mean, it to me, Tony, so many of the things that you said really can navigate across all different types of labor and staffing that we have. It's not just about the development directors. I mean, some of these things that you were talking about, their core values of a well-run organization. And Without so a doubt. We need to have it. Well, everybody, thank you, thank you for joining us. You know, we, we end every episode with this mantra and it goes like this, to stay well so you can do well. See you next time.